All right, everybody. Well, maybe that gave people a, a, a little bit more time to get into the room. So welcome to Canna Chat uh, for the G1NBC Cannabis Network. I am John Spaulding, hosting today's show. And we have John Davis, uh, assistant professor from the Department of Integrative Physiology and Neuroscience at Washington State University. I think I got yeah. it right that time. You did. You yes, did yes. Well, thanks for being on here. I'm sitting here in the grass, uh, and we are going to be talking about your background. So tell us a little bit about how you got started in cannabis research, a little bit more about your background, and, and, and kind of what brings you here today to, to, to talk about your work. Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having me on, and uh, just a little bit about my background. So I'm a trained neuroscientist, and um, the, the work in my lab really focuses on how the the gastrointestinal tract or the gut communicates with the brain to control behavior. And one of the things that we focus on is feeding behavior. And the other thing is intake of chemical drugs like alcohol and cannabis and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And so um, kind of how I got my start was understanding how bariatric surgery controlled feeding behavior and drug addiction. And so for just a, a quick example, when you do bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery on patients, one of the things that happens, not surprisingly, is the, the patients lose weight and they resolve type 2 diabetes and that sort of thing. But we were studying it and one of the unexpected consequences was that it changes their addictive um, potential. And by that, I mean people that don't drink alcohol turn into alcoholics following the surgery, whereas people that are alcoholics stop drinking. And what happens is when you do the surgery, it changes the sensitivity to alcohol so that people that never drank before you know, all of a sudden love to have one to three or four beers, whereas somebody that drinks 10 beers a day knows they only need to have two because they're so sensitive. Right. And that really opened my eyes to the, the power of how the gut's talking to the brain to control more than just feeding behavior, but really these cognitive emotional behaviors like addiction and things of that nature. Um, so that was all done at University of Cincinnati where I had great training. And when I moved the lab to Washington State, they had just legalized, they meaning state of Washington, just legalized recreational marijuana. And naturally I was intrigued to understand how marijuana controlled appetite and, and what all was known. And there have been you know, several investigations you know, over the last few years at that time, looking at how THC, for example, one of the cannabinoids in marijuana stimulates appetite, but not much more beyond that. And so that's kind of where I got into it and, um, started to think, okay, maybe my lab should start working on this. And, and that's, that's basically how we got our start, really. Gotcha. Uh, <clears throat> t t touching on that point um, about the uh, cannabinoids and them affecting, do they affect, because people always talk about that. Is that a, is that a misnomer or does it actually happen that it, that it does affect the brain to uh, want to eat? Yeah, it's, I, I said it's, it's not really a misnomer, but the, the way that it's been studied, I would say, is more from the angle of THC and separate cannabinoids okay. rather than the whole plant. And, um, you know, one of the first things we did is we looked at the sales by product type throughout the state of Washington to see what were people buying and using. And it's about 78% of the sale is flour, dry flour. Right. rather than extracts. And so that told us that people going into rec or medical dispensaries are really going to the flower for some reason. And so that's what we wanted to study rather than individual cannabinoids alone. Okay. And so are you doing, uh, do you do your research on humans or do you do them on animals or both? Uh, right now we do it on animals. And what we're doing is trying to understand kind of the basic fundamentals of how is cannabis regulating appetite? What are the physiological changes? What are the you know, neural changes in the brain that are leading to this um, change in feeding behavior? And then once we feel like we have a good handle on that, the next goal is to try to do a, what's called a translational approach where you start to work this out in patient populations and figure out if, if what you've learned can benefit perhaps someone that has anorexia, for example, or even somebody with obesity because some of the things we're finding suggest that Marijuana may even be able to inhibit appetite in certain contexts. Okay, that's interesting. So, so first round is doing some testing, and then next is taking it further to, to the human application and seeing if you can impact different dis disorders and 
and Absolutely. diseases and things like that. Yeah, got, got it. it. Uh, what are some, uh, are there any other FDA approved clinical human studies for cannabis or synthetics? Um, so there's been a number of FDA approved. Um, so historically there's Marinol and Dravenol, and those are both THC analogs that have been approved for appetite stimulation. Um, I can't remember the exact year that those were approved, but it's been some time that they've been out on the market. Um, you know, unfortunately those prescriptions aren't universally, um, you know, tolerated yep. or um, effective in most patient populations. Um, sometimes it works for a few days and then there's tolerance. Other times the euphoric effects of the drug are, you know, adverse to people. Um, but fast forward to now and there's actually um, Epidiolex, which is a CBT, excuse me, CBD um, analog. And it's being used to treat uh, epilepsy. So in particular, patients with a condition called Dravet syndrome. And, you know, that's what I know of that are FDA approved that are out on the market right now. Um, gotcha. And is that, there's is a that lot similar of other to things. seizure disorders? Is that a type of yeah, that's what it is. seizure disorder? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And so those are the ones that I know of, Marinol, Dravenol, and Epidiolex, which is, again, CBD, whereas Marinol and Dravenol are, are THC. Um but I'm assuming that there's a lot of other investigations that are trying to get into the FDA approval, you know, arena, which, you know, kind of what we're doing is the first step, right? You have to do preclinical research in animal models to figure out what is, you know, the compound or combination of compounds and, and have the mechanism of how it's affecting the behavior to get to that point. Yep. Uh, what other types of, uh, I'm sure it's difficult to get FDA approval. Yes. Uh, are there yeah. other, uh, other than the uh, the FDA approved ones? Are is there other cannabis research that you know about that's currently being conducted, or different types of research? Maybe just like surveys or interviews or anecdotal type. Yeah, so that's a great question, and there and actually at our um, university here, we have a number of really talented researchers that are investigating all sorts of you know aspects of cannabis, and so we have people that are plant biologists that are trying to understand exactly how the plant itself is, you know, what are the constituents in the plant and, you know, different strains mm -hmm. um, of different strengths of compounds. Like, you know, what are the, what's the genes that are regulating this and how are the physiological changes in the plant being able to convey and translate over to the person using it? We have people like me that are studying, you know, what's the biological effects of the plant in animals and in humans and, you know, looking at, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety disorder, um, feeding, things like that. So just here within our university, we have a number of really talented people doing those sorts of things. But across the, the nation, there's also a handful of people working on different aspects of it. Um, and in California, I know there's a, a, a very good research group at University of California, San Diego, working on the seizure activity. Um, there is a, a very good group at University of Utah working on sort of the neural correlates of using different cannabinoid compounds. Um, I also believe there's a, a group at Thomas Jefferson. I can't recall exactly what they're working on, but those are the ones that I know of. So th there, there's a handful of different places doing it. That's cool. I, it's, um, I assume it's, it's more prevalent and more popular in universities in states that, that have some type of legalization measure for the plant. Um, but it sounds like there are some other ones that are, are, are just going ahead and, and doing research. As yeah, well. you're exactly right. You're exactly right. And one that I forgot is University of Colorado, right? They're, they're a big, you know, sort of um, have a big presence in, in that, that arena. Are there, um, are there uh, research, uh, oh, I forget, like research seminars or research, you know how they have a weekend and they get together speakers and things like that relating to this type of work specifically? Yes, there is. Um, you know, so we have just normal departmental seminars that we do like in-house and throughout our different campuses. But there's also a cannabis meeting that I believe is happening this May in um, in New Mexico, and um, and I could be wrong on the state. I just I've received emails about it. I'm not attending the meeting, so I didn't pay too much attention. But there's there's at least a one, you know formal meeting where people that are studying cannabis come together and, and talk about it. And our state, usually once a year, we have a cannabis meeting that's held in Seattle together with the University of Washington. Um, 
and I've attended that before. But those are the only really the two that I know of. Um, mm -hmm. There's small satellite groups at different meetings. So, you know, Society for Neuroscience is a big one for neuroscientists and there's satellite meetings there. And there's also the Obesity Society, which is a, a really important one for metabolic disorders and um, diabetes and obesity. And there's satellite meetings held there as well. Gotcha. Um, so let's talk a little bit about research quality. I've heard sure. that like some of the quality can be limited by the lack of plant material. What are some other inhibitors to, uh, uh, to research? Man, that's a great question. So, um, what, what probably most people aren't aware of because w why would they be aware of it? But it takes about 18 months on average just to get a schedule one DEA license. And that's allowing you to have cannabis or heroin, you know? So, um, wow. it's, it, it's a it's a uphill battle. How long um, did you it, say it took? It took us about eighteen months, from from start to finish to even get that. And so that's really prohibitive for a lot of researchers because you don't have two years to sit around. You know, when you're on a ten year clock or you're competing for grant funds or these sorts of things to, to kind of wait. So you're kind of reinventing a whole new aspect of research in your lab. So it takes a little bit of um, of luck and um, you know confidence to be able to pull that off. And then once you get the, the research license, you have to go through the process of being able to acquire a product. And in our country, all of that comes from the National Institute of Drug Abuse Drug Supply. And you know the way that it works is they have contracted a university to grow cannabis so that they can supply it for, for researchers. And and they you know they're doing the best job they can at this, right? I mean, they're they're growing as many different kinds as they can and they're supplying it for people like me and people doing um, you know clinical research studies um, one one of the issues is that the the quality of the material hasn't been what we see in in the communities right and so right. No, nowadays you go into a dispensary and THC content for example ranges from 10 to 30 percent um, the stuff that we're able to get from NIDA drug supply is about 10% max. So it's not necessarily modeling um, what you see in culture, but at the same time, the Drug Enforcement Agency and NIDA drug supply, you know, they're, they're not, you know, growers, right? Yeah, you know, right. It's not their forte. And so they're, they're doing a, a tremendous service to us, but that, that is an obstacle is being able to get um, quality product i'm and, sure the and, fda is thinking you know you're lucky we're letting you go this far with it yeah exactly <laughs> exactly and you know fortunately we um we've been able to connect with a, a a group that has basically acted as a liaison for our lab for my lab to allow us to um, get an import license and so we now have an import license and and this is fda approved and dea approved and we're able to import cannabis from anywhere in the world to do research on it. So we're really excited about that. Yeah. And that, that's stuff that's you know going to be coming up in the next few months. Okay. What was the process for obtaining that license? So that one was really quick, actually. Okay. Um, and we worked with a, a company that's um, out of based out of California, and who are some really sharp um, individuals. And basically, that process took about from, you know, I'm still waiting on the product to, you know, come to my door. But to get the import license alone probably took around, I would say 45 to 60 days. It wasn't that long gotcha. relative to the first process. So rather quick. So just an offshoot question, cause it popped sure. into my brain. Did you know, like heading out to uh, Washington state that you would be getting into this type of research? No, I mean, actually, you know, <laughs> the funny story is it, it takes about four days to drive, you know, from Cincinnati to Washington. Mm -hmm. And I kind of conceived this while I was driving 12 hours a day, you know, with me and my dog <laughs> and just, you know, the dog was probably tired of listening to me talk about it, but um, nah. I had I had no idea and I didn't know the channels or the, the things to go through or, or anything like that until I got here and started really thinking about it. Okay. So, um, and I think you were starting down this road. Tell us a, a little bit more about some of the projects that you're currently involved in and what, what, what are some of the outcomes that you're looking for? Sure. So, so the first thing we wanted to do, um, I think I mentioned this earlier, is we wanted to model what was going on in the culture. And so we were really keen on understanding what's the type of product being used in our state around us. And it turned out to be that the majority of the purchases and dispensaries are for cannabis flower. And so 
then we set out to figure out how can we create a model to you know mimic what's going on in humans and we chose to use vaporization of cannabis flower okay and so we made vapor chambers for rodents for mice and rats mm -hmm. and then you know once that was done we waited on the supply we got that and the first thing to do was to to do like a dose response and figure out does cannabis stimulate appetite in rodents you know the way we've heard about in humans for for many years now and the, the short answer is yes it did but one of the things that we we, we saw really quickly which was kind of not surprising was that it's not an instant appetite stimulant right so okay. it's not like you give the animals cannabis and they walk over and start eating the food within a minute right you know that's definitely not the case it's more like they you give them the cannabis and there's a delay in feeding so they don't eat it all for probably about an hour and then after an hour they start to eat and by two and three and four hours later they've eaten more than animals that have just been exposed to air for example and so that that was important for us because not only did it mean that our model had some face validity because you know you hear about people that they're eating and it increases appetite after cannabis and and almost never did they say we instantly go eat it's usually two to three hours later yeah so we felt good about that but then it also allowed us and this is getting to one of our first published research projects on this to think about what what could be going on in that one hour period that would maybe be helping the brain get ready for appetite and so to address that we actually looked at a specific part of the brain called the hypothalamus mm -hmm. and the hypothalamus is it's a well-known brain region for regulation of feeding and so what we wanted to do was we said what is changing genetically in the hypothalamus in that one hour time period so is there some sort of reprogramming that's happening in this brain appetite center after you give an animal cannabis that makes it want to eat for example and so, um, so that's what we did. We looked in the hypothalamus and we looked at a specific genetic mechanism that's a very rapid mechanism and it's called polyadenylation. It's a, a mouthful and I won't go too much into it. I'll just say it's a very powerful um, regulatory mechanism that controls genetic programming. And what we found was that genes that are involved in controlling how neurons talk to each other and genes that control dopamine release were very you know significantly regulated following cannabis exposure and also very rapidly regulated within 60 minutes of exposure we saw this reprogramming of genes that control dopamine and synaptic remodeling in the hypothalamus and so you know at that point we thought okay cool we now have you know a pretty cool story animals will eat after cannabis they do have significant quantities of thc in their blood you know, so we give them a drug test basically, right. and they have significant quantities within 10 minutes, you know, of giving them cannabis. So it's really rapid, but what's the mechanism, you know, so we looked in the brain and we found this genetic mechanism. And so we, we published that work and that has led to, um, to more ideas and more projects. And one of those is to understand, you know, how much dopamine is being released in the brain when you give an animal cannabis. And does it matter if you give it to them one time or, 10 days or 14 days in a row. Um, so that's, that's one project. And the other project is to try to understand the physiologic signals that are in place. And so, you know, what happens is you have hormones released from your gut that go to your brain and they tell you when to eat and they tell you when to stop eating. As it turns out, there's only one that stimulates feeding and it's called ghrelin. And our lab and others around the world have studied this for, for many years to try to understand how it regulates food intake. And what we find is that when you give animals cannabis, it stimulates ghrelin, it stimulates this hormone that's made in your stomach to go work in your brain. And when you block its secretion, animals won't eat after you give them cannabis. And when you block its signaling in the brain, animals won't eat after you give them cannabis. And so that's something that we're actually getting ready to send out for publication soon. We've been working on that project for about two years and adding more and more, you know, evidence to that, I would how, say. How do you stop the release of that? So there's actually an essential amino acid called L-cysteine. And when you give it to people or animals, it blocks ghrelin secretion. Okay. And so we had already published papers on that aspect of how you could block it. And so we were kind of comfortable with figuring out that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's, you know, Having said that, what we think right now is there's a couple of different things going on when someone uses cannabis. One, 
there's a very rapid change in the hypothalamus that's occurring to reprogram genes that are involved in food intake. But number two, there's also a um, physiologic angle to it. So things that are coming from the GI tract to regulate food intake are also being stimulated that actually in turn talk to the same brain region, the hypothalamus, to turn on feeding. So there's a couple different pathways that cannabis is using to stimulate appetite. That's cool. That's some, that's really neat. Um, it, it's it's uh, <clears throat> the expectation for for our chats is to highlight different areas of of kind of the cannabis community. And so mm-hmm. to hear from the, the, the research end and, uh, and the stuff that you guys are working on, that's really neat. Um, what would you say is the future of cannabis research as you envision it or, or as you see where it's going? Like what needs, sure. yeah, e- either some things that need to happen or some things that you see happening and, and where well, it could yeah, go. That's a, good, that's a good question. And so I think right now we're, you know, this, this research in terms of looking into the plant itself and figuring out what are the positive benefits for human health is kind of in its infancy. And what I see in the future are investigations that look at what are the, you know, cannabinoid constituents in the particular plants that are causing a positive benefit, be it reduction of anxiety or stimulation of appetite. But in other words, figuring out which strains do the endpoint that you want the best, and then going and going back into the plant itself and figuring out, okay, well, what's in here that's actually doing it. That's one thing that I think is going to happen and is probably already happening. The other thing is to understand more about the biological and biochemical mechanisms that are being stimulated by those particular plants to allow alleviation of some of these symptoms. Mm -hmm. Um, Kind of like what I just described, but for not just feeding behavior, things like anxiety and depression um, and, you know, different mood disorders, things of that nature that people are, you know, already using the plant for and and finding success. And then the hope is that once you have figured out the mechanisms in the particular plant that someday people can go into a dispensary and say, I need to eat. And the bud tender says, okay, go over here. This is exactly what you need to stimulate appetite. And here's why, but don't go here because that's for something completely different. It may not make you eat for four or five hours. And right right now that's not where we're at, right? You go into a dispensary and you talk to the bud tender and you tell them I need it for this or that. And, and they're not using, you know, information that's medically or scientifically informed for their patients. And Mm -hmm. it's because they don't have it. Yep. Yep. Right. They're doing the best they can. So I I see those, those three things kind of, you know, melding together in the future to really shape the way this industry is going. And I think there's a lot of, you know, unique and interesting opportunities for innovation right now, while it's in this early stage to kind of figure out how to push those agendas forward. Absolutely. Uh, that's so cool. I, I, I was thinking of like, you, I was thinking possibilities for your research or potential would be that, that the, the, the bud tenders would be able to list those things on their, on their, um, I don't know, like at the store, like when you walk in and you see the, the, the list of things that it can, it, it can help. And so oh, have that like a- and have that. Yeah. That's neat. Like a I'm menu, really... a menu of sorts, mm-hmm. and and not only that, but the the growers would benefit from that as well. So you know, right now the product comes and it has THC content and CBD content, um, THCA content, and also the pesticides that were used on it. But that's it. And you know, when people go into the store, they're looking for the cognitive emotional value of the plant, not necessarily the chemical content. And so by having, you know, a menu on there of these are the pathways that it affects, this is what it will stimulate, this is what it will inhibit, that is like, it gives brand equity to that product, right? You know, when when you say Adidas or Nike, you automatically know I'm talking about shoes, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. you're not thinking Mm -hmm. a car, you know, and so so in the future, I think we can get there by doing more um, scientific based studies to to help help the industry out. Awesome stuff. All right, well, Mr. Davis, thank you very much for being on Canna Chat. I yeah, appreciate thanks for having it. me. Yeah, and uh, it, it's good to hear about your research. Also, like I said, good to know that the the research side is, is doing its part out there to uh, to help all of us stay more informed and and uh, have a better uh, a better product out there for when we reach full legalization, which I'm sure will be happening soon.
Yeah, yeah. Anytime. Thanks for having me, and uh, I enjoyed it. All right, everyone. This is John Davis, uh, assistant professor from the Department of Integrative Physiology and Neuroscience at Washington State University, and this was CanaChat. We will see you guys back soon. Thanks, John. Yeah, thanks, man. All right.